in that wants to settle in. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll now just jump into the section. If anybody, you've got one minute. If you want to pitch something, if you want to ask a question, it's not an opportunity for dialogue back and forth. So if you ask the question, you've got this burning question you have, you know, somebody has that answer, take note of who it is afterwards. You can go and meet with that person. Um, does anyone want to start? Is it, and, and again, I've got the timer here. Does anyone want to go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. So I'm Michelle Lee. I am a mortgage broker, so I can help anyone that might need it. We do all sorts of lending uh, with Ontario Lending Solutions. So we have 62 different lenders. We do everything from A lending to private lending and reverse lending. So I'm here today. If you ever need any help, please let me know. I'd love to help you. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead. Hi everyone, my name is Daniel Chafetta, I'm an investor in Guelph. I have an assignment on the Edgewater building that's on 71 Wyndham Street South. I purchased it uh, three years ago, it closes in one year, it's on the 12th floor overlooking the river. Uh, it's a beautiful condo, two bedroom. Um, I'll, I'll be full disclosure on the price and everything like that, if you're interested, it, it closes in one year. So, um, yeah, let me know if you're interested. Okay, awesome. Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, hi. Uh, Henry Zisco. I'm actually a, a mortgage broker in Canada. I also do PSCR loans in the U.S. Um, so if you folks ever interested, then I can discuss. Okay. Anyone else? I just uh, wanted to do one yeah, thing before. Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to get a selfie. Ah! Awesome. <laughs> Everybody in there, mostly? There we go. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. uh, I'll, I'll do a quick one uh, because Glenn is here. I'm going to do a little brag. We do have a property in, uh, my wife and I, we have a number of investment properties, but we do have one in Florida. It's actually a short-term rental close to the Orlando area. It's been running great for us. We're super happy with it. If anybody uh, is looking at considering buying a place down there or having a look at, uh, at renting down there, I'd be happy to send you the link and have a look at it and happy to... I'm an open book, happy to answer any questions on that investment down there as well. Uh, anybody else? Okay, with that, I think we'll close that part out. Uh, so I wanna go ahead and welcome Adrian. I'm super excited to have you speak, uh, and uh, I'm sure he's gonna talk a little bit about his background and where he's from, but Adrian uh, is going to be talking about a few different investment strategies. Adrian was a former police officer, I understand, and has now gone into full-time full investor mode, has built his uh, portfolio up to quite a few doors. Uh, so I'm super excited to hear what you have to share with us, Adrian. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. So I always kind of start off, I've done several of these in the past several years, but I always start off with just trying to gauge uh, the level of experience in the room, and I kind of cater some of my slides and whatnot to that. So. Everybody in the room, who has one to three investment properties? Pretty much everybody. Um, who has more than five? Who has more than 15? <laughs> okay, who has more than 15 in Canada? <laughs> I, one thing I want to drive home today is if I can do it, you can do it. And um, I really, really uh, hold that sincere to my uh, presentation, hold that sincere to uh, what I want to drive home to you today. If there's nothing else you take from me, I want you to take away that if I can do it, you can do it. Um, at the young age of 23 years old, I was hired with the Peel Regional Police, and I was a police officer in Mississauga, Brampton. Uh, so I was 23 years old, I just got married, um, had a little daughter, she's now a big daughter at the back of the room, and, and <laughs> in a black dress, but uh, uh, Vanessa was a little girl back then, and I just got hired uh, with the police, newly married, got sent off to police college, and it was probably 10 years into my career as a police officer that I thought to myself, so I put my 30 years on the job, what's gonna happen when I retire? How am I gonna live the same lifestyle? Now that I'm on a pension, reduced income, so on and so forth, and the best thing I could think of was real estate and real estate investing. 
uh, just because I'm a meat and potatoes kind of guy, I want to be able to know I can touch something. I'm, I don't, and there's nothing against it, I don't play the stock market, I don't know how to play stock market, but I know I can go to my property and I can touch it, and it'll always be there. So that gave me security to invest in real estate. And um, so I'm 35 years old, and that's when I completed um, just about just over 10 years on the job. And I thought, okay, well, real estate is safe, and um, I want one or two rental properties. So when I retire, I can subsidize my pension, have some cash flow from those two rental properties, and I'll be able to live the same lifestyle and not have to worry that my income is slightly less because I'm obviously on pension. So that was uh, about, give or take, 12 years ago from now. So that's me, and that's basically what I told you. And my, back to if I can do it, you can do it. 10 years later, I own 82 multifamily properties, 415 units in just over 10 years. So what started out is I want to have two rental properties and cash flow has turned into a real estate empire that I've managed to build in just over 10 years through the power of joint venture partnerships. Obviously in Canada, there's probably not a lot of ways you can scale to that size on your own. It's just, that's just the facts because either you run out of leverage or you run out of money. Um, sooner or later, you're gonna run out of capital and or the banks will uh, stop giving you money here in Canada, a little bit different than the States. Um, so long story short, the two biggest things that helped me scale that, that to that size was uh, joint venture partnerships and the Burr strategy. Those are the two meat and potatoes of my success and obviously <clears throat> mindset, creativity, and we'll, we'll get into that. Um, everybody know what the first strategy is? Yeah? Buy, renovate, refinance, rent, repeat. So the people in the room that said you own one to five, one to 10 properties, do you own multifamily properties or condos, single family homes? Duplex. Duplexes. Condos. Condos. So why did you buy a duplex and why did you buy a condo? What was your mindset? Well, with duplex, you have higher income rent coming in than if you were to just rent one one family or one unit. So pretty, higher cash flow. Pretty straightforward. <coughs> so why did you choose to buy a condo? Well, we had a condo like near uh, like a, 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 a really good location, so subway station. It kind of makes sense, you know, to get into the condo market. It's it's co cost less than the the single family or the townhouse. Yeah. So right. Cost, yeah. Do you cash flow on your condo? No. Are you negative cash flow now with the interest rates? Yeah, with the interest rate. Yeah. Okay. So I and I don't think there's anything wrong with condos or anything wrong with single family home investing. <clears throat> I personally don't have any in my portfolio, so out of the 83 homes that we own, there's not one single family home in my portfolio, there's not one condo. Not that there's anything wrong with that, it's just I'm more like this lady that I believe in cash flow and that's why I go to multifamily and our portfolio consists of everything from a duplex, our biggest acquisition is a 47 unit purpose built apartment building. We have everything in between, six units, 10 units, four units, 12 units. Um, but we love the stability of cash flow as well as, I know if I have four units and one, one tenant leaves, I still have three units covering my expenses. So I'm not dipping into my pocket per se. We have that security. That's what attracted me to multifamily. It's not necessarily for everybody. There are. Yeah, you have four tenants in one roof, so you may have more problems, for sure, as opposed to this gentleman just having a condo, but it's really, what are your goals? What are you after? Um, 
some kind of basic slide. That's why I asked everybody your level of experience. But in, in I guess, Cole's notes version, one to four units is considered residential. So you're typically, you know, a residential uh, mortgage on it. Five units and above is commercial lending. Residential lending, one to four units, is a whole other animal than getting a loan for an apartment building. As you know or don't know, commercial lending is all about you, what's your debt, how many loans do you have, do you lease a $200,000 Jaguar, so on and so forth, what's your debt, uh, what's, what's the total of your debt, and they're gonna base that on your income, your mortgages, your credit card payments, your lease payments, and that'll dictate how many mortgages they're gonna give you, the bank. On apartment buildings, you can own a hundred apartment buildings in Canada, no problem. It all comes down to the building and what's the net operating income of that building. And based on that NOI, they're going to tell you we're either going to give you 60% loan to value on the purchase, 65, 70. But once you stabilize that building and you get your new tenants in and you get your new rents and you refinance that building, the CMHC programs on apartment building loans are incredible. I don't know if anybody's heard of the, uh, and I don't want to get too, I want to keep it uh, kind of short and precise, but there's a new CMHC program for apartment buildings called MLI Select, if you've heard of that. MLI Select, if you qualify for that program in Canada, you could get up to 95% loan to value with a 50 year, up to a 50 year amortization. So picture what that does to your payments. Picture what that does to your cash flow. But that's a whole other lecture on apartment building uh, investing. Keeping it simple for the audience, four units and under residential, five and above commercial. So my favorite word, the burr, which we, we've already said we know. Obviously in investing, there's the Burr strategy, you can buy turnkey. By the way, when I started, when me and my wife, my wife works for the police department, she's a 911 uh, dispatcher. So when we started, the bank gave us five residential mortgages, and then we were tapped out. I had the police job, she has the police job, so we qualified very easily, banks love that fire, police, teachers, just a steady income that you could show as opposed to being self-employed, which I am now. Most realtors like yourself, right? Unless you have that, you have to show two years of income, steady, blah, blah, blah. So we had great income and we were able to qualify for five residential mortgages. <clears throat> After that, we had to think of different ways. <coughs> okay, I wanna keep going as most of you in the room that have two, three, four properties, it becomes addictive. You want more, and another one, and another one. The Burr strategy, and I'm gonna focus on that for the purposes of today, as I mentioned, allowed me to scale to over 80 properties. And as everybody knows, the easiest way to tell you, the goal of the Burr is to leave very little to no money in the deal when you refinance the property, right? Plain and simple. And why do we do that? Because I want to take that capital and I want to take it out and I still want to cash flow and I want to buy my next one. And I want to rinse and repeat that process. So when we do burrs, I typically, I'm in and out of a project, depending on the size of the building, if it's your typical triplex, fourplex, I'm in and out in eight months. Money in, Money out, eight months, I'm looking for my next project. Obviously, if I'm buying a 20 unit apartment building, it's gonna take me longer to complete that project because obviously I have to move the tenants along, then I have to renovate 20 units, and then refinance the building, and then still the concept's the same, money in, money out, onto the next building. Um, but, Typically on the residential side, the triplexes and whatnot, we're in and out in eight months. Before the market changed, and we all already know we're in a different market now, before the market changed, 
we were batting 100% to get all of our capital out on every single project we took part in in the last five years. There were a number of instances where we got all of our capital out plus $70,000, which basically is the surplus that I like to say. So all your money out plus a surplus. That changed. It changed because the market changed and now it's a lot harder to have 100% burr in the market we're in here in Ontario. I'll be the first to say that. Doesn't mean it's a bad investment, it just means, hey, you may own a $1.1 million fourplex and you have 30 grand left in the deal. Is that a bad, is that a bad investment? I personally don't think so. You own a $1.1 million real estate with $30,000 of your money. You can't even buy a decent car for $30,000 anymore, let alone a $1.1 million asset. That, let's not forget, every month the tenants are paying down our debt. We have cash flow, and obviously over time, we have passive appreciation. So the bird strategy, in my opinion, is where it's at. Um, we covered this, my favorite strategy, the burr, and what's involved in that. I can't stress enough though, when you take on a burr, every step of that burr is important. Your purchase price is important. Obviously, your renovation is probably one of the most important things. Is you're taking on potentially a $200,000 reno, and if you're not working with a contract, <coughs> contractor, or you have experience in the game, and things start to go sideways on a $200,000 reno, it could get serious really, really fast. And it could definitely make or break your Burr project, right? So every step of that process is super important. And there's so many things out there on the internet, working with professionals, working with a joint venture, hiring a professional to coach you, and so on, if it's your first rodeo, I would highly recommend it. Like, the power of leveraging that could save you a ton of time and a ton of money. Like, I can't stress that enough. So, another great thing here is your power team. Don't underestimate the value of your power team. And I think the people in this room, if, if you stop and you think of everybody in your circle, Every one of these people are super important to your success, right? Your mortgage brokers, your contractors, your insurance people, property management, so on and so forth. So important to your success in this world of real estate investing, let alone the Burr strategy, but even just as real estate investors. If you don't have a good, dedicated real estate mortgage broker, and you're just working with somebody at the bank at TD, there's a serious problem, in my opinion. There's a serious problem. You know, there's two mortgage brokers in the room. Leverage them. Don't go to the bank and deal with the branch level. I, I personally, out of all the deals I've done, I've used a mortgage broker on every one. That's just a small example of how important your power team can be. Your contractors, right? Who do you, who, like, what references do they have? What projects do they have? So on and so forth. Everybody has a bad story about a general contractor, which is why I started my own company. We'll get to that. Everybody has a, a, you know, a super bad story about a general contractor. They took my money, they didn't finish the job, their work was lousy, um, they told me the job was going to be done in four months, it took 19 months, and on and on and on. So that could make and break your, 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 your project. Real estate agents, why? and I get this a lot, why would you stop for a second and work with one of your friends just because he's a real estate agent, but he has no knowledge about investment properties, right? So, but then, you maybe attest to this. Um, so I'll get a call, and it's so frustrating. I'll get a call, people know I'm a licensed realtor as well. People know I'm a licensed re realtor. People know all the experience I have in the real estate investment world, but they went and bought this triplex with their buddy because he just got licensed and they felt sorry for him. 
But then they close the deal, and I'm the first guy they call. Yeah. Right? Hey, Adrian, I bought this house and this triplex. I was wondering, can, can I pick your brain on a few things? And the first thing I think of is, so you bought the house with somebody else, but now you're coming to me for advice. Yeah. It doesn't work that way, right? But anyways, super important. Work with a realtor that's investor focused. You know, how many rental properties does your realtor have? How many, you know, does your realtor have experience in market rents, in comparable investment sales, in dealing with investment properties? Why not work with a professional? Are you gonna go to, you want a Cadillac, but you're gonna go to the Honda dealership, right? Doesn't make any sense. So basic stuff, guys, but you'd be amazed how many people just don't grasp it. Um, obviously, multifamilies, several units in one building, the debt pay down, the passive appreciation, the cash flow. These are all things that my multifamily properties do. Obviously, bigger commercial properties, more units, you're going to have more cash flow, depending on the size of the units. You're going to have more cash flow than your typical duplex or triplex. But the goal, again, back to my favorite word, the bird, the goal is to extract as much money as you can on the refinance, <clears throat> steal cash flow at the same time. There's no property that I own that I want to get into that does not cash flow. <clears throat> We've kind of touched up on this financing, pretty straightforward. I talked to you about, oh, how did I start? I started with a $200,000 line of credit. When I started buying real estate 11 years ago, I didn't have money in the bank. I was paycheck to paycheck. I just got out, like I said, uh, I was a young police officer. But what I did have was equity in my home. So my wife and I leveraged everything we had and we started with a $200,000 line of credit. And if I not, don't say anything else other than another great piece of advice, take action. Had I not taken action 11 years ago, I would still be in the, doing a job that I did love, being a police officer, working night shift, the whole nine yards, but the difference was I took action. So you could come to all these things 12 times a year, but if you don't take action, honestly, it's a waste of time because there's never going to be a 100% perfect scenario for you to say, now's the time. There's never going to be a 100% perfect scenario for that. So you can sit back there and, and think maybe next month, next year, I'm gonna wait to see what happens. Maybe things are gonna change by June or after the spring market or next year. Go ahead, wait. What did everybody do when COVID hit? Everybody said, whoa, I'm not doing anything because the world's gonna end. What happened to real estate? And how many times did I tell some of my people, some of my JV partners, now's the time, now's the time, and they all laughed at me. So point, don't wait. Buy real estate and then wait. Um, raising your NOI for distressed properties. When we, when we do our units, we are always above market rents. And the reason why is because I don't, first of all, we cater to young professionals. So in our units, I don't rent to families. Um, our units are typically 500 square feet, small, no storage space. Um, <clears throat> our two bedroom units are decked out, so we're talking quartz countertops, stainless steel appliances, <clears throat> porcelain tiles, vinyl click flooring, pot lights. <clears throat> you know, we really try to appeal to that AAA tenant, the young professional is what we are after for several reasons. One, our two bedroom units start at $1,900 a month plus hydro, 500 square feet, no storage, one closet in the bedroom, that's it. There isn't even a closet typically for them to hang their coats. $1,900 plus hydro a month. We also charge $65 a month for each parking spot on the property. 
You want to park in the driveway? It's $65 a month per vehicle, young professionals. Because when they come home from work, they don't want to drive up and down the street to find a spot on the street. So they gladly pay the $6,500, $65 a month per vehicle to park in the driveway. So we have $1,900 plus 65, so we're at $1,965 a month plus hydro, 500 square feet. <clears throat> Again, now we have unit one on the main floor, unit two on the second floor. Typically the loft is a bachelor. I'm talking a fourplex. And then the basement is either a one or two bedroom. But our two bedrooms start at 1900. Food for thought. So why don't we rent to families? One, there's, our units are small. They're only 500 square feet. Two, um, and you get this, you probably see this a lot. When you, when we're selling houses, right? And you're on realtor.ca and you read the description here and it says, um, long-term tenants, awesome tenants, triple A, want to stay. Why is that attractive to you as a buyer? Because for me, that's the worst thing in the world for me. <laughs> so why realtors put that in their listing? No idea. It's a disadvantage <laughs> as a buyer to read, this guy's been there 10 years, he pays on time. I sure he pays on time because he's paying 600 bucks a month. Why wouldn't he pay on time? But it's a disadvantage. So if you flip the charts, and he has three kids and two dogs, and they make all kinds of noise, and they disrupt all the other tenants in the building. We want the young professional who's going to stay a year, maybe a year and a half. They're going to leave. We're going to go in and we're going to do a couple paint touch-ups on the wall from when they hung their pictures, right? And then I'm going to raise the rent by $150 a month. So my, my rents are current with what's happening in the market. Obviously, if they stay five years, I can't stop them. But realistically, I want them to come. It's either their first or second place. They're young professionals. Within a couple of years, they're going to move on. They're going to find their, their fiance or get married and move on with life. And that really is, works to our benefit. So we attract them because of our finishings. And then they leave because one, they grow out of the space. It's only 500 square feet. They grow out of the space. Think of what you pay for your mortgage right now on your primary residence if you have a mortgage. Think of you have your whole house and your mortgage is whatever it is a month. And now think how much space you have in your house in comparison to what my tenants are paying me. This room here with the kitchen and everything is probably bigger than our two bedroom units. And they pay me, let's round it off to 2,000 a month. They pay me $2,000 a month to live in this square. And they leave a year and a half later and then I raise the rent by $150 a month. That's why we like young professionals. Uh, refinancing. So like I mentioned, usually eight months after our BRRRR project starts, we're in a position of refinance. What happens at refinance? Very quickly, guys, you probably already know this. But we call the bank and we say we're ready to refinance our property. Our renovations are completed. Right? The bank sends a certified appraiser to the house. They go through the house and they look at all the improvements you've done to the house and then they go back in, their, in front of their computer and they pull comparables. What's sold in the area comparable to what you've done to your house? Obviously the goal is to force the appreciation through the roof by your renovations so when the appraiser comes through you can say, and they're not stupid, you can't throw a coat of paint on the wall and change the, the, the knobs on the kitchen cupboards and expect to do 100% burr. Never going to happen. But if you go through the house and you can, you can you know, say, as you can see, Mr. Appraiser, brand new kitchen, brand new countertops, all new stainless steel appliances. These floors are brand new. The trim, the doors, the roof, the windows, the furnace, so on and so forth. Now you have their attention because they're writing all this down. And then they're going to go back to their office, pull comparables, look at the data, 
you know, obviously, I even prepare a budget we've spent on renovations, and I hand it to them. Here's everything we did to the home, and here's what we spent on the home. Please take this and consider it when you prepare your report for me. It's worth the time to do that as well. Um, I'll touch upon it quickly because one of my colleagues, one of my first responder colleagues in the room, who has his head down and pretending I'm not going to pick on him, <laughs> um, asked me while we were on break or when I arrived, can you talk a little bit about how I segue from buying uh, residential properties to apartment buildings? Uh, so without um, keeping in line with timing, it's the easiest thing you could do in the world, to be honest with you. It's much easier than, than, than you think. And it really comes down to your power team, and it comes down <coughs> uh, to the lending and the building. And that's why I say it's easy. So if you've established a good power team, and you have some good people in your corner, that's, that's the first thing. But like I mentioned a few minutes ago, Commercial lending is so much easier than residential lending. You just maybe at the onset will need more capital money for the acquisition, but to be approved for the mortgage, it's, it's so much easier because they're not looking at you and an individual anymore. They're looking at the building. What does the building qualify? What's the net operating income of the building now? And what's the net operating income of the building after you stabilize it? So they're going to want an appraisal, right? They're going to buy this building. They're going to want a commercial appraisal on the building to start. And then they're going to want an as-is value from the appraiser. And they're going to want an as-complete value from the appraiser, right? So, the, and then they're going to want you to provide them, okay, what are you planning on doing with this building? Well, I'm going to renovate it. Okay. We want to see a construction budget. Show us a construction budget of, you know, you, you say you're going to spend $400,000 on renovations. Let's break it down in a construction budget. Let us see what you're going to do. So they look at the appraised value. They look at your construction budget. And then your appraiser is going to even take that and they're going to say, okay, if you stabilize this building and you renovate all these units and you raise the rent, to market rents, the appraiser will do an ask complete value and they'll say, okay, this building, you bought it at 1.5 million. If you do all these things to this building, this building will now be valued. We're going to value this building at $5 million. If you manage to jump through the hoops and then qualify for CMHC financing on your exit, huge, huge. Because residential refinancing, it's all about comparable sales. What sold in the immediate neighborhood in the same quality? Period. They don't care if my triplex produces $7,000 a month and your triplex produces $5,000 a month. What, what the meat and potatoes is, is comparable sales for that triplex. But you and I can own two apartment buildings next door to one another. Let's call it, they're both 10 units. Yours is here, mine's right next door. Yours produces every month $8,000 a month. My building, exactly the same, produces $15,000 a month. My building is gonna be worth so much more just based on what my building is producing compared to yours. It's all about what the building <coughs> produces What's the net income of that building, period. And they're going to base your, what they're going to give you on that loan based on that. So it's actually easier. You don't have to worry about, well, I already have three mortgages. Am I going to qualify for a fourth? And, you know, I lease a car. My wife leases a car. My daughter has a car, and I put her lease in my name too. So I have all these lease payments that are all affecting your debt ratio. They're all affecting your debt. But commercial lending does not uh, take that into consideration. The primary factor is the building. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, it does. 
Thank you. Are you going to segue from a duplex to buying a 20 unit building? I probably wouldn't do that on my own. I would seek professional help, whether you decide to work with a professional company, a coach, a mentor, uh, or you get together with some people that have done it in the past. But all those things are available to you. Um, obviously, like the gentleman that was presenting before me, he's running a business, but people think, okay, paying $2,000 for his course, wow, that's a lot of money. But he's been at it the last 12 years, developing and honing his knowledge, his skills, his ability, his team in all these different states. How much money do you think he spent over the years building all that knowledge? A lot more than $2,000. So if you're not willing to put in the time and the money to learn it, then pay for it, right? So think of it that way, guys. It, there's always a cost to everything, but you could be so much more ahead by leveraging other people's, and all you gotta do is pay. We talked about your power team. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. So here's a couple examples I wanna share with you. And I know one of the first questions you're gonna ask me is, when did you take part in those projects, right? For sure you're gonna ask me that. So midway through 2022, let's call it right after spring, we did this project. So I'll run through the numbers quickly with you guys. Um, we bought the property for 740, 20% down payment was 148,000. This is a fourplex by the way, this is a residential deal, not a commercial deal. Um, so our first mortgage was 592. We spent 116,436 on renovations, which really, in the grand scheme of things, with a fourplex, it's really not a lot of money. So you're talking four kitchens, four baths, four of everything going into this place. I mean, you renovate your basement nowadays, you spend 60 grand, let alone four apartments. But anyhow, so eight months later, this property refinanced for 1,170,000. So 80% of 1,170,000 is 936, so that's our new mortgage. So then we just subtract, you take 936, you minus your original mortgage, you minus your renovations, your carrying costs, your closing costs. And lastly, your original down payment, you're all out plus $40,000. That's a perfect burr. Could, let me ask, let me answer before you even ask me. Could I replicate those numbers today? No. Not in today's market. What I could do in today's market is probably either all out, but not the surplus of 40 grand. Those days are gone. Or potentially leaving, like I said, 25,000, 30,000 in a deal. Doesn't mean it's a bad investment. There's another example here, but it's very similar. Not as good, um, but very similar. So this was an apartment building. Um, yeah, this was an apartment building. I want to say it was a 12 unit, 12 or 14 unit apartment building. And those who have, you know, without going through every single number, this is how the numbers played out on this apartment building uh, refinance. Take a picture of that slide if you want and analyze it, but long story short, uh, that's how the numbers played out. Essentially, we got all our, our capital out with no surplus. So what I did, and again, I'm gonna come back to it. If I can do it, you can do it. And this isn't a sales pitch, <coughs> being 100% serious. Um, so what I, what I did was when we started to scale our business, and I started to scale by joint venture partnerships and buying all these properties, I thought, Getting back to everybody has a bad story about a general contractor. <clears throat> I thought, what if I bring everything in house? We have enough units now, we have enough properties where I can bring everything in house and we can have the peace of mind that I'm not calling somebody on Kijiji to come and do my burr. I want my own construction company. So at least I know these are people on my pay payroll. I can call them up and say, you six guys are going there tomorrow and you're finishing that project because we're behind on that project or this or this or that. Obviously, we work with joint venture partners at a very high level. 
our joint venture partners find security in knowing that our construction company just works for us. They're on our payroll. So there's nobody to blame when a project's uh, not going in that direction other than us. And my thought was, if I keep this in-house, I can control it and then we can deliver what we say we have to deliver in our BRRRR projects. So that was number one. Because believe it or not, I probably lost about $70,000 over my projects because certain contractors took our money and ran. And it probably happened three or four times to me before I said, I'm not doing it anymore. I'm bringing in our own people and I'm starting our own company. Um, the other thing I thought was, okay, we have all these units, we have all these joint venture partners, why don't we have our own property management company to look after our properties so we're not relying on somebody who really doesn't care about our properties. So we started our own property management company as well. So we have our in-house construction, we have in-house property management, and we facilitate everything from step one to step 10. So why is that attractive? If you're an investor who has a very busy career, who has children, who has a whole nine yards, and you don't have the time or the knowledge or any, you know, that regard to execute this on your own, our company does everything. If you're the kind of guy that has to swing the hammer, and you're the kind of guy that has the time to do that, and you have the network to do that, then by all means you should do it. But if you're the in investor who wants I guess to remain passive and just take part in different uh, great opportunities. We built this system to execute that. Definitely not for everybody, and a lot of people want to do it themselves. If you have the time and the knowledge, by all means, and or um, mentorship from somebody, do it. You should do it on your own. What I learned was the power of leverage sometimes can save you a lot of time and money. But I'm here to tell you that, again, back to my very first sentence, if I can do it, you can do it. And I did it, remember, the first 10 years of me doing this, uh, I, I did it while I was still having a full-time job. So it's not impossible. It's really not impossible. But it does take time and dedication to get through. So we built this system of uh, joint venture partnerships to accelerate people's portfolios should they want to invest in real estate and essentially not deal with anything from step one to step ten. Um, most of our investors that invest with us in apartment buildings get uh, annual returns of anywhere between 20 to 30 percent return on investment in apartment building space. Uh, most of our investors that invest with us in triplexes and fourplex uh, typically get, even in today's market, 85 to 90 percent of their money returned to them within the six to eight month period of our Burr project. So we forecast the numbers, we sit down, we look at them together, and we say, okay, again, I can't control the market. If the market tanks, am I going to guarantee those results? Absolutely not. <clears throat> Why would I guarantee those results? I don't control the real estate market, right? Um, the Bank of Canada apparently does, but um, yeah, typically within uh, eight months, you're getting 85 to 90 percent of your capital back at point of refinance, and you still own the acquisition, and you still cash flow. But again, if you can do it all on your own, it's worth a shot. Just make sure you have people in your corner that can help you if things start to go sideways. Um, I, I touched upon all this, obviously EPC is our company and partnering with a professional company, if that's what you're after, can definitely help you out. We talked about we have the in-house property management, the in-house construction, so on and so forth. Um, and that's us. So if you ever want to chat, you ever want to pick my brain, um, we're all over social media, um, Facebook. Instagram, LinkedIn, um, we're very, very easy to find. Follow us. We always have some great projects on the go that, who knows, maybe you know somebody or yourself want to take part. 
like for example, that's my email address. If you want to shoot me an email, hey Adrian, I was at the Guelph seminar. I have a question for you, blah, blah, blah. Let's connect over a phone call or even a Zoom meeting. <coughs> that's how you can get a hold of me. Um, I want to tell you, the last thing I want to tell you about is um, I made some really good uh, connections in the off-market um, commercial space. Uh, so within the last few years, uh, we developed a really good reputation in, um, with off-market wholesalers. So we're on their lists now, and I usually get one, at least once a week, if not once every two weeks, I'm getting off-market deals presented to me by these off-market wholesalers. They never hit the MLS, and most of you, um, whether you know or not, these great deals never hit the MLS. They're always done behind the scenes because these old school Giuseppes who own these buildings think all realtors are dirty and they're gonna take their money, and you know, why should I pay a realtor? I can do it on my own. So a lot of these awesome deals never ever hit you know, hit Realtor.ca, for example. They're done behind the scenes. So here's an example. <clears throat> uh, more of a bigger project, but I, I ended up locking up a 14-unit St. Catharines, 14-unit uh, apartment building. In 12 years I've been at this, I've never had this opportunity, but it's completely vacant apartment building. 14 units. Never in 12 years have I ever had the opportunity to buy a completely vacant apartment building. And to boot, it comes with permits. So we bought the building, we've locked up the building, 14 units, per, uh, permits in hand from the city, because it's a gut. It's a, it's a gut. It's a start from scratch, so to speak. Uh, so tremendous opportunity. Uh, we don't have to worry about cash for keys for tenants and negotiating for tenants to leave and all that. It's vacant and permits in hand so we can start swinging hammers the very next day we get keys, which again is typically not the norm. So these are the kind of deals we're coming across. Obviously we have smaller stuff, triplexes, fourplexes, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, if, if you want to get on our mailing list uh, to get part of these deals, I can send them out to you and whatnot. Um, follow us on social media. Send me an email. Hey Adrian, I was at the presentation. Love to get on your mailing list for some off-market opportunities. You don't have to join Venture. I'll just send you them. If you want to take part in them, I can uh, negotiate the deal for you and whatnot. Obviously, like I mentioned, I'm a realtor as well. If you want to talk about joint venture partnerships, we can do that as well, but it's, it's not the end all be all. It's really up to you and what you're after, but glad to shoot you deals, off-market stuff as they come along. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and that's about it. So. <clears throat> I'll, end, I'll end off by saying um, thank you for having me. Uh, I always like giving back to the community because, uh, believe it or not, 11 years ago I was sitting at the back of a classroom just like this, and I had two properties. <clears throat> I just bought my first two. And I'm sitting at the back of the classroom, and there's somebody, there's, a, there's two gentlemen giving their lecture. And they started off telling their story, and they said, now we own a hundred units across the GTA. And I'm sitting at the back of the classroom and I thought to myself, wow, I can't even begin to imagine owning a hundred units. Like that sounds completely out of reach, right? 10 years later, I'm standing in the front of the classroom telling everybody I own 415 units. So, I'll leave with this. If I can do it, you can do it. I have no education. I didn't take any business courses. I was a police officer. I went to college. I went to Seneca College. And I took law enforcement. And then I convinced a recruiter to hire me and, and give me a police job. I got no training in business education. Zero. Zero. So if I can do it, you can do it. Thank you for having me. Once again, thank you to Adrian for coming out and speaking to us. I really appreciate it. I found it very, very informative.
normally I open it up for a couple of questions. Uh, yeah, you able to take a couple. Okay. Yes. Does anybody have a question? Go ahead. How long it takes for you to take out the tenants when you buy a? Uh... <laughs> That's a million dollar question. <laughs> every, every. Uh, first of all, I'll start off by saying there's no magic trick. If your tenants are paying and they pay on time and all that stuff and they're not causing problems, there's no magic way to get them out other than to pay them. We pay our tenants to leave. And How we much? pay them quite How well. Much? How much? How much? Okay. <laughs> okay. And you're not going to believe this, but I'll tell you a story. The cheapest I've paid a tenant to leave is one month's rent and they left. The most expensive check I ever wrote for a tenant to leave is $25,000. I've actually negotiated with a tenant in one of our uh, townhouses. Uh, we bought a townhouse complex, 13 townhouses. Don't record this. <laughs> uh, we bought 13 townhouses. 